correct uh, the supercharged budgetary performance in the state of California in 2021 and 2022. Uh, the need to right-size expenditures, uh, the need to right-size uh, in relationship uh, those expenditures to revenue is self-evident as it relates to some of the projected shortfalls that we announced in January uh, and we will be updating here today in May. Uh, fundamentally, the approach we will be taking today is a little bit different than the approach we've taken in the past. Uh, we are not looking at the budget year alone. We're looking at the budget year plus one. We're looking at the next two years to take operating uh, deficits uh, and to have uh, what I loosely refer uh, to as operating uh, reserves, operating surpluses over the next two years. Uh, we'll lay out today uh, in some detail uh, how we uh, propose to do that uh, with the humility and understanding always uh, that this is a proposal and this is a process that will unfold over the course of the next uh, many weeks working with legislative leaders, uh, working with uh, groups large and small uh, and being attuned uh, to the mood of the public and where people are in relationship to some of these proposals. Uh, it goes without saying and you'll ask me I'm sure in the Q&A uh, why this cut? Uh, I will uh, undoubtedly say I prefer not to make this cut. Uh, these are programs. These are uh, uh, propositions that I've long advanced, many of them. These are things that I've supported. These are things we work closely with the legislature to advance. None of this is uh, kind of work you enjoy doing, uh, but you got to do it. Uh, we have to be responsible. We have to be accountable. We have to balance the budget. And so uh, we are submitting today a balanced budget, but we're doing so mindful of the world we're living in. And I remind you every year, uh, as I think previous governors have, of the volatility that is the tax system. And yes, you'll ask the same question we get asked every year, shall we or should we reform the tax system? The answer is yes. Uh, how we do that is a more difficult and challenging uh, conversation. And, and the volatility uh, is foundational uh, in terms of the tax system we have, the progressive tax system we have today. Uh, it's been our friend. You can see those spikes. Uh, going back to 2000 on the left uh, to uh, just a few years ago, 2021, uh, on at least the right of the screen that I'm looking at. And just to put it in perspective, we talk about this chart as an EKG chart. Um, it's a revenue chart and relates to capital gains. It's the volatility is capital gains as a percentage uh, of our income tax receipts. And to put it in perspective, uh, on the far left there, you'll see in that 2000 uh, peak, it was roughly about 10.4%. Uh, of our capital gains uh, that were realized as percent of revenue uh, that year. It spiked to 11.6% uh, in that higher spike on the right in 2021. That represented $349 billion of capital gains realized, $349 billion of capital gains realized. Uh, last year, 2023, down to $137 billion, 350-ish to 130. Seven, and that's that drop. But here's the long-winded story of this chart. You can see it's back to some normalization. What I mean by normalization, again, a period of distortions and corrections on the basis of the supercharged budgetary performance. We're going back now to more historic norms, and I mean historic in this context. The average over the course of the last many decades has been about 5, 5.18% capital gains. We're slightly below that in the budget year. We project to be slightly above or roughly at that uh, in budget year plus one and two. And that's the line uh, trailing off to the right. But here's the January number that you're familiar with. This is the number we put forward, $37.9 billion problem statement uh, in January. We were uh, very clear that uh, there was a lot of volatility, a lot of questions as it relates to tax collections. Uh, those tax collections uh, came in November Numbers uh, came in December, January, uh, February, and March, uh, about $5.8 billion uh, lower than we projected. And there was some dust that settled after the tax collections in April, and we'll get to more specific details here in a moment. But I want to remind you, uh, a few moments ago, meaning a few weeks back, we moved uh, quickly with the legislature to address $17.3 billion of the problem statement, to address uh, the issue of the deficit by moving um, in concert uh, with an early action. We don't want to applaud the budget chairs. I want to applaud uh, legislative leaders for their support and their recognition, the importance of actively managing the budget, not waiting to pre-described uh, or predetermined dates on the calendar, but to actively manage in real time 
uh, the challenges. And, and we did that, you could see, through a series of very familiar solutions. And revenue and borrowing, delays, deferrals, issues around reductions and shifts, things we'll be talking a little bit more about today. As it relates to a bit of that preview, I mentioned the $5.8 billion through March. Uh, you extend that and you look across the spectrum of costs and revenue. Uh, the problem statement now has increased uh, by additional $7 billion from the January budget. So today we're submitting a $288.1 billion balanced budget, $201 billion general fund with an additional shortfall that we'll have to manage of $7 billion. So a reminder, $27.6 billion shortfall uh, total now. Uh, and I say reminder because we, in January, announced a $37.9 billion shortfall. Uh, we took that early action of $17.3 billion. We have an increased challenge of $7 billion, and it nets out to what we have to solve for today. $27.6 billion budget challenge. So let's get into this. How do we address, again, from a multi-year prism, this problem? Not just a short-term uh, strategy, but to get us back to right size uh, to address that remarkable volatility. And, uh, and forgive me, uh, you've heard this on so many occasions. But when I say remarkable volatility, when I use the word supercharged, um, uh, those are expressive words, uh, but it's expressed uh, by the reality, $177.7 billion two-year operating surplus, simply unprecedented uh, in U.S. history, let alone California history at a subnational level, that is, at a state level, uh, followed by uh, the dust settling and these shortfalls. Uh, so here we are today, um, and we are facing a $27.6 billion challenge. Next year, to my point about a multi-year strategy, uh, we project a $28 billion shortfall. Um, it's, I think, appropriate and prudent for us not just to solve for this year, but to also solve for next year. And that's the proposal we're laying out and we are providing uh, and offering the legislature for consideration. If we move forward with the recommendations uh, set forth uh, to address this structural issue, uh, we would enjoy uh, a count additional $3.4 billion in surplus, a $650 million surplus uh, in uh, budget year plus one. So again, moving from two years of deficits to two years of operating surplus is what we're recommending uh, the legislature seek. Uh, why are we confident we can achieve this? Because it's solvable. We've done it before. And this is just a reminder of the totality of the challenges in the past, again, on the basis of the volatility of our tax structure. The benefits of a progressive tax system during good years, the challenges uh, during years where uh, things are contracting. Markets disproportionately impact and benefit or burden the state of California. Again, capital gains playing an outsized role as we demonstrated in that first chart. But you can see uh, back the previous administrations, Schwarzenegger and Brown administrations, some of the challenges uh, those administrations faced and they move forward. And state proved its resiliency, its capacity for renewal. Um, and we worked through those issues. And today we're doing more than ever for more people. Uh, than we have ever done in terms of providing supports. And I think if there is a theory of the case we're making here today, uh, the solutions we're about to set forth are overwhelmingly uh, supporting existing core programs without cuts. And I say overwhelmingly, not exclusively, because I'm not naive. There are areas where core services are being impacted, but the vast majority are being protected. Existing services provided to existing people. Core services are being provided in this two year, uh, are being protected in this two year blueprint. So let's talk about what that blueprint looks like. Simple, getting back into balance. This is what we believe it would require and this is what we propose to the legislature. We propose uh, pulling down this year 4.2 billion in reserves. I'm gonna to get to that in a moment. $3 billion of new efficiencies. I say new because they build on the 5% efficiencies that we announced uh, a year or two or so years ago. Uh, reductions of $15.2 billion. We'll talk about those reductions in the context of being one-time versus ongoing. And we're talking about shifts and pauses, not dissimilar to the early action. And revenue and borrowing, which is primarily, if you're asking, MCO, ta MCO and, and net operating loss. And then some borrowing that we'll discuss as well. Uh, the 2025-26 solutions, 
previous slide. I'll go back. It's for this budget year. Here's what we're proposing for budget year plus one. Draw down an additional $8.9 billion. That would be a total of $13.1 billion over those two fiscal years, $3.6 billion. The efficiencies start to annualize at a higher benefit. Uh, ongoing reductions, as I noted, for one time, and, and ongoing considerations. Expansion pauses, again, for the revenue borrowing, not just some of the two I just referenced. So that's the framework. Let's get into some more detail. Uh, I mentioned when I brought up the issue of reserves, uh, that uh, the $13.1 billion is what we want to pull down, but I want to just caveat you. So that 4.2, we want to pull that down over a two-year period. We don't want to pull all 13.1 into the budget year. We want to do the $13.1 billion uh, over the two-year budget window. So $4.2 billion uh, in the May re revision for this budget year, and budget year plus one, forgive the vernacular, plus one, uh, out year, uh, we are looking to draw down from the reserves $8.9 billion. So that's that line on it. On the efficiencies, you recall the $3 billion. Uh, this is how we propose to do it. 7.95% reductions, roughly 8% reductions. Uh, that includes my office. and includes agencies, large and small, across the state of California. Uh, we believe that kind of belt tightening would allow us uh, to enjoy not just $2 billion of uh, budget year savings, but ongoing savings, as you can see, annualizing about $2.7 billion. It means sweeping, and this is a familiar number, the numeric, $762.5 uh, million. I announced that in January. Works out to about 10,000 sweeping, uh, plus or minus 10,000 vacant positions. Uh, those positions are being determined in real time at every agency and department. Uh, they're making that determination. We don't have the list of every single vacant position for you today. That's a process that will unfold over the course of a very short period of time. It's a process that is unfolding uh, as well in real time in terms of the work that's being done at the agency and department levels. So we want a leaner government, leaner government, streamlined government. We want to do what all of you are doing in your personal lives, all the businesses out there are doing in their professional lives as well. And we think we can do that and still achieve outstanding outcomes. I'll give you an example. Just yesterday with generative AI, uh, that is not a job killer. In fact, that's explicit in our executive order as it relates to artificial intelligence. But some of the new programming we're doing in partnership with Anthropic and Google uh, and others, and OpenAI, as it relates to traffic management, as it relates to issues around, uh, well, access to languages and other services. So uh, that's a component part of our leaner government and our more efficient uh, government uh, and the flexibility of providing choice, meaning people where they are, giving customers, meaning giving taxpayers a voice uh, in terms of their needs uh, and government's uh, services. Back to the reductions. Um, and. We have our two experts here. They'll go through these in much more detail uh, because there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of actions that we are taking. There's not just one or two. Um, and we can spend, and I, I'm known to spend a lot of time up here, but I don't think you want to spend that much time with me up here. So I'm just going to give you some broad strokes, and uh, our experts here and up on stage can walk through in more detail, but, but you deserve at least a deep, a broad strokes understanding of the one time versus ongoing, which is represented again here in the budget uh, year. In the budget year plus one, this is the additional one time and ongoing savings. But let's break this down so you can take a look and understand a little bit more of what these things may include, what they do include in terms of the proposals uh, that we are offering the legislature. You see the one time on the left, you'll see the ongoing on the right, the one time uh, are familiar. Uh, and a lot of those one time uh, we are considering in the context of, of how they work into other um, uh, programs that we provide, existing programming uh, and utilization rates. Always looking at utilization rates uh, and looking at other forms and other strategies in terms of drawing down more federal dollars or looking at what's happening at the city and county level. So you'll see a, a mixture uh, of uh, very familiar issues um, and some deserve more attention than others, and I imagine you'll have questions, everyone will, certainly, uh, on all of them, but uh, notably on a number of them. I'll give you an example on broadband. Uh, we've been stress testing our broadband strategy in the middle mile and the last mile, and we think we've come up with a plan uh, to actually achieve similar goals at a lower cost. Uh, so we think it's appropriate to claw back those dollars 
without a diminution in terms of programming uh, and advancing the commitments that we've made. As it relates to uh, workforce, uh, we have uh, $2.4 billion new resources that are coming in uh, that we're leveraging from the federal government, disproportionate amount of that leverage from the federal government over the next five years pursuant to Prop 1. We have facilities grants that we think we can incorporate uh, into strategies for new bonds uh, in the state. We can discuss where we are with the bonds in relationship to the legislature. Uh, I imagine that will be a question. Water storage as it relates to what is being programmed now and what we uh, anticipate needing into the future relationship to the old Prop 1, the $2.7 billion that was set aside for some of the water storage uh, workforce, uh, meaning these sort of apprenticeship programs, learning-aligned employment, what we're currently doing with the utilization rate, we feel uh, we can make some adjustments. Children, youth, and uh, behavior, and we are, this is a passion project for me, as you know. Uh, we still have 4.1 plus billion dollars in this, and we're actually streamlining that program and really targeting in zero to 26 behavioral health initiative to the school sites, wellness centers, and uh, we think we actually could deliver even more bang uh, for uh, the, the existing uh, buck, as they say. Um, on the Cal Works, there are no cuts to the Cal Work. And remember, we, we did 2019, a 10% Cal Work increase. In fact, in 2019, we did an additional 13.1 on top of the 10%. Uh, we continue the COLA on Cal Works. This is just an administrative component part. Uh, the core service remains in place. And, you know, sweeping some bonuses under HAP. Um, I know that may not sit well with some, but um, we're struggling with seeing the performance I want to see on the streets and sidewalks. And we've been clear about that. And you've been, many of you have been a lot of events uh, where we've expressed ourselves pretty clearly on this. As it relates to just some of the ongoing, uh, I want to talk uh, about the prison issues. We've saved, and, and again, everything I say can and will be scrutinized and corrected. So I'm mindful of that as I sit up here without a note. But $3.4 billion from 2021 to 2027 is projected to save $3.4 billion in terms of the four prisons that we've already closed and the seven yards that we've closed. So you've got $3.4 billion of ongoing, we've saved, or we'll project to save, uh, from 2021, climb back a few years, projected through 2027. We are proposing to shut down at 13 prisons an additional 46 housing units that would reduce the census of beds by just shy of 4,600. That would produce ongoing savings on an annual basis that would grow of $80 million starting uh, in the first year it's enacted. In fact, we're also moving to pool. Chuckawalla was uh, projected to close down, and by the way, that's one of the four uh, that I referenced. It was projected to close down in March of 2025. We're looking to pull that forward as early as November of this year. So we've been scrutinizing that budget. We're mindful of the census and population. We're mindful of the direction um, that we're going as it relates to public safety, and we could talk more about that. Uh, but prison housing unit deactivizations can happen much sooner than prison closures and provide us more flexibility. And this builds on the existing $3.4 billion uh, that we programmed in savings on the basis of the four prior uh, institutions that have closed in those seven larger yards. It does not mean, if you ask me later, legislative leaders have asked me, are you interested, are we considering collectively uh, reducing the larger footprint with prisons in the state? The answer is yes, we are, but we want to do it in a pragmatic and thoughtful way. We want to be mindful of labor concerns, community concerns. We want to be mindful of trends, and we want to be mindful of the unknown, meaning there are proposals to roll back some of our criminal justice reforms that could have a significant impact on census and population. There are lawsuits, there are initiatives that could have impacts on costs. All of those need to be factored in, but we are moving and we're moving quickly uh, to focus on uh, addressing that issue. The middle class scholarship, um, I, that, that's again, the perfect proof point of something that I uh, enthusiastically supported uh, back when I was Lieutenant Governor. And I think it was, you know, John Perez and others will work with Governor Brown to initiate the program with $117 million in the first year. We're basically leveling and setting back to where it was. It's about $100 million, um, was 117, but that's the haircut of the enhancements that we've made the last few years, not because we enthusiastically want to do that, quite the contrary. Uh, so those that expressed disappointment in that, 
let me add my voice to that. Maybe I'll provide you a quote uh, in relationship. It's, again, reality. It's math. Being mature about the challenge, the problem statement, it's aligning that expectation. What are the core services that we can maintain and continue to enhance versus the things that we'd like to do that are important? That's certainly one of them uh, that right now we feel we're unable to do. So that's just a, a broad strokes on that. I talked about pauses and some of the issues that were just delaying. Perfect example of this is a program that's uh, proposed to go in effect in, and, th and this is a good example, a program that's not in effect yet. So it's not a cut to an existing service that's being provided. It's a program that's proposed, great program, great program, that goes into effect in October of 2025. And we want to delay it two years. If the resources present themselves, this would be a top priority to put back in, and we would encourage the legislature to consider that as they consider uh, this proposal itself. The child care expansion's uh, more difficult, isn't it? Um, I'll take a back seat to no administration in terms of our advocacy in this space. And this was a, a difficult one. The trade-off here was $724 million, and that's represented in the two-year contract uh, of providing our providers more support. The question was, do we look to cut that commitment and reduce wages, or do we just sort of hold the line on where we are with the expansion for the time being? I, I thought it was right to fulfill our commitment to those providers. I think they deserve that raise. What we're trying to do is stabilize this workforce, professionalize this workforce. Uh, we've unionized this workforce. I'm the first state in the nation to do that, and I was proud to promote that, um, not just receive that on the back end as someone else's proposal. I'm working with the Women's Caucus, uh, who's next level in terms of their support of this expansion. So the goal is ultimately 200,000. Um, you know, I'm mindful of my sell-by date as governor. I'm still committed to getting there, but right now we feel like we, again, don't want to cut programs, just want to hold the line, but we still want to provide uh, more uh, line support for our line workers. Uh, so that was just um, being transparent about our considerations as we balance the child care space. Uh, we talk about shifts, a lot of movement. There's no material cuts to the climate agenda. Uh, there was a lot of creativity in moving into the cap and trade program, uh, the uh, greenhouse gas uh, fund. And so you'll see some of those shifts in there. Transit budget uh, substantially uh, uh, is, uh, is whole. I think it's about $150 million uh, a, a shift from a $4 billion base, uh, but substantially whole in clean energy programs, that programs accordingly. And you can see that representing that $4 billion in the cap and trade fund. And by the way, uh, we just promoted uh, the uh, anniversary of the cap and trade auctions, not the cap and trade program, which was established well before the first auction. That's been 10 years. Uh, $28 billion, $11 billion has already been invested, 76% of that in low-income communities, 76% of that in low-income communities. Um, and so this cap-and-trade pro program continues to be rightfully envy uh, of programs uh, around the world, not just uh, across the country. Uh, as it relates to other shifts, you'll see some creativity here. Let me just briefly go through a few. Again, the team here could go into detail uh, for you. Um, Prop 56 backfill, we want the MCO to address that. The issue around ARPA, there was actual, this is the dollars that came from the feds, there was interest attached to that. We can sweep that interest and we can shift that off the general fund. Uh, moving the capital annex and the work that's being done there, we can move that to bonds. We were proposing to do that in the beginning. We worked with the legislature. We were in a position we didn't have to. Uh, now we're going back to some of the original proposals. And the cannabis fund um, is looking again, the set aside in the cannabis fund, child care dollars that would have, been, would have been absorbed under the general fund. Now we're pulling in the cannabis fund as an example. And then there's a PG&E settlement that nerd to the benefit of the state. Uh, and we are borrowing, shifting, uh, borrowing uh, those dollars, uh, 78 million, significant but modest considering the totality of some of the work we're doing. So those are just examples for you. And remember, the slide I showed you before, hundreds and hundreds of other examples, programs uh, that, uh, that we're proposing to make uh, change. So the question is, well, all right, there's some examples of what you're proposing to delay or deny for the moment. What are you saving? Well, just things that were on the well, part of the conversation, I should say. I don't want to say they were on the chopping block because I don't think they never got there. Uh, but they were presented uh, as proposals. SSI, well, SSP, states program is SSP. It's a relationship to the SSI. 
I want to maintain uh, that support. As I noted, the Cal Works as it relates to the COLAs, wanted to hold the line. Earn income tax credit, I think it's one of the great anti-poverty programs in this nation, the state. I was an advocate as mayor of San Francisco as one of the first cities to do an earned income tax credit advocate uh, as lieutenant governor. Governor, we went from $400 million on the EITC to over $1.3 billion. We added the $1,000 child tax credits. We added a foster youth tax credit. We want to hold the line, maintain those credits because we think they're important. Uh, we also want to maintain our health care expansion across the board, regardless of ability to pay, uh, regardless of pre-existing conditions, and uh, your uh, your in, in immigration status. And uh, I just think that's foundational. It's something I believe in. It's the core of, I think, who we are as a state, and uh, we should be as a nation. A uh, care court, um, new pathway, new strategy, moving away from the old binaries, unsupported, not substituted care, we think is important. It relates to the issue of our time, and that's addressing the streets and sidewalks. And then on broader nutrition programs, uh, we're holding our summer EBT programs. We're holding all our food bank programs. Uh, we're holding our programs that relates to some of our creative $35 million senior programs where there's a lot of sort of flexibility and where those dollars can go. So I just want folks to know that. And I want to thank Senator Skinner you know, for making sure uh, we were uh, sensitive on the nutrition. I want to thank Senator Eggman and Umberg for sensitivity on the care court. And I want to thank, um, you know, um, leadership, remarkable leadership of the Latino caucus on the health care expansion. I want to thank Rambola and, Obviously, uh, great work Mary, Delana, Mary Elena Durazo has done for decades as an advocate and now uh, as someone who's been delivering on that promotion and promise. So just examples uh, of things we are keeping. Again, back to this notion, keeping core services intact for those that are existing beneficiaries of services. Vast majority, not all cases, is that achieved with the proposal we're setting forth. Question we're getting a lot, Prop 98, what is... January look like, or rather, what does May look like in relationship to January? Our per pupil in January, we announced a familiar slide, 17653. Here's the May um, uh, per pupil. It's slightly down, about $151, looks like. Um, making sure the numbers slides align with what is in my head. And then all funds is slightly up, which uh, is encouraging. So Prop 98 per pupil in May, 17500 and two dollars, and you'll see all funds slightly higher. Um, local reasons that's the case: twenty-three thousand nine hundred and forty dollars. Begs then the cola question, doesn't it? Cola was at 0.76 in January. Uh, interestingly, because I don't know how else to, I think it's a word that is appropriate in this case. It went up uh, to one point oh seven. Only the uh, People you know, that, that study physics and mathematics and engineering could possibly explain the Prop 98 formula uh, to explain exactly why the COLA went up, uh, but it has. We also drove driving down, as you recall, and that was in the January budget, 8.4 billion uh, on that stabilization count within the 98 framework. So that remains consistent from the January proposal. Two things I'll close with. Um, we want to address this issue of volatility and end as I began homeowner insurance <laughs> preview, because if you're not going to ask the question, you should have, um, because it's a real issue and it's top of mind for all of us. And I just wanted to update folks on our thinking on it and where I think we are as a state. But the issue of revenue volatility, this is uh, the, the second to last slide. We, we are mindful uh, on the basis of, of our experience with, again, the supercharged capital gains, uh, $349 billion dollars. 2021, the 2022 numbers, the volatility, um, that we know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. And when, and this is why I believe we need to have a two-year mindset going forward. I think the new normal should be budget plus budget year one. And that, that's a deeper conversation. We're starting to socialize that with the legislature and, and how we can advance that. I think it's the only way with a progressive tax structure that you can prudently manage moving forward. And I think the last few years have really underscored that. As it relates to that volatility, we're looking at the constraints under Prop 2. And I've remember, I reminded you, I, wanna, I think you've got to reform the Prop 2. Legislature believes that as well. The question is, what does it look like? But the deeper question is, will the public support it? I mentioned to you in January, we've done a lot of outreach on that. We've done some research on that. And the public doesn't necessarily see that right now as reform is one of their top agenda items. So that's going to take some work to I don't want to say educate because that's patronizing. We're always getting educated. 
uh, and I think that's enlivening. Uh, but to really express our point of view in a way that sort of saturates in a state larger than 21 state populations combined. In the interim, I don't want to wait. Uh, and that's why we want to move forward with this new strategy uh, that our two experts here uh, will discuss. And that's to address, again, this volatility, these, this incredible, uh, 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 you know, the incredible acuity uh, that is represented in this volatility by establishing a, a new budget account in the state. Uh, that would capture this excess revenue and uh, allow us on the basis of historic trends to set it aside until it materializes as opposed to assuming it's coming in on the basis of the LAO and the finance and experts saying we believe it will come in and then we appropriate and attach appropriation to it only to discover it didn't come in a la what occurred in the last two fiscal years. So the idea would be able to create that account. Yes, they're GAM, GAN questions. We're all, we were, a, lot of, a lot of questions. And we're working through those questions. Uh, but it's something I'm, I'm very excited about and very grateful uh, for Erica and uh, for Joe's leadership in this space. And I'm very grateful to legislative leaders for their willingness to engage in this conversation. So I don't want to, not much more I can say on that, uh, except to say we've had some preliminary conversations. Intellectually, people get it. There's some legal questions we have to address, but we think it's an interesting uh, interim solution until we address the larger solution as it relates to Prop 2 uh, and some of the questions around the GAN uh, limit. And remember, GAN was created before Prop 2, and we're just stacking all of these things. That's why dubious a lot of these constitutional questions that go on the ballot, locking in this, locking out that. We have to be very careful about all that, and forgive me, that's a rabbit hole. We can go down. It's one that's being adjudicated across the way at the Supreme Court. As it relates to uh, this issue of homeowner insurance, final uh, slide. Uh, we did an executive order, as you recall, about a year ago. And we're trying to reconcile 30 years where there hasn't been much reform in this space. We're mindful uh, of uh, voter-approved uh, constraints. We're mindful of the challenge and burdens that have been placed on our FAIR plan, which is our backup plan. And, and we're deeply mindful uh, of the day-to-day -day travails of trying to reconcile these screaming headlines and the reality when you get a notice that your insurer may not want to reinsure, reinsure or extend that insurance or you buy a new home and you can't even get that insurance. So this is, uh, this is real and it's being felt across the United States. And uh, you know, I have a chart if you're interested, you may want to ask me, you could take a look at the cost of homeowner insurance nationally and it's places like Florida and elsewhere. I mean, for all our challenges, Let's just not have theirs. And so we need to get ahead of it. And I know our insurance commissioner, uh, we're in constant contact. His team is working their tails off. I, I know how concerned the legislature is on this. But we're going to do some trailer bill language uh, uh, with this budget. Because the most important thing we need to do now, in addition to all the other things that we laid out in the executive order, all the other things that the insurance commissioner has already announced he wants to do. But December, I don't think... We have that much time. We've got to move this. And I know 30 years and they're getting it done in just a matter of relatively speaking months, but we, we just got to do more. And he needs to have all the support and res uh, resources to do that. Uh, but we need to get this rate ruling process done. And that's why we want to expedite it over a 60 day period. Uh, we need to stabilize this market. We need to send the right signals. We need to move. We need to move. And insurance commissioner again knows that. I, I know. It's broadly shared. It's the how. It's hard business. Uh, we share the same goal, uh, but we need to do more. And so that's just something I wanted to highlight before we end the presentation uh, and uh, move to the final point, which I guess I lied. There were three slides, um, not two, because, you know, I'm proud of this. You know, back to resiliency. You know, I think that's, there's a thematic here. You know, the normalization, the alignment, um, the expectation alignment as well. Um, but, but the fact remains that we remain the fifth largest economy in the world, seven years running, $3.89 trillion. Um, Germany, $4.4 trillion. Japan, $4.2. Watch India. Uh, I want to say we remain the fifth for as long as I can because India is moving. Uh, but we don't begrudge other people's success, quite the contrary. But we maintain our success and our stature as the fifth largest economy in the world, uh, despite all of 
uh, the macroeconomic swings and challenges. And, and I, I just wanted to highlight that. I also want to highlight the record uh, uh, tourism, uh, 150 plus billion dollars. Um, uh, not every part of the state is enjoying pre-pandemic levels. Bay Area is still trailing a little bit. Other parts are enjoying record-breaking uh, tourism. That's a very encouraging sign as well in terms of California's stability, but it's record high. Uh, in terms of the tourism spend and, and populations increasing. And I'd say that just it's time to update the memos, it's to update the talking points. Uh, it's time to update the doom loop um, on some of the networks uh, on that issue. Um, that includes uh, one of the platforms, uh, Social Truth or uh, Truth, whatever it is, uh, that uh, former president uh, has started. So I uh, want to get him to update that talking point as well just for the purpose of the truth imbued in the platform, truth, social. Um, so those are three things I wanted to highlight, and that's the resiliency of, of, of you know, roughly 40 million Americans strong, or it's the resiliency of a, a dream that was promoted and is realized every single day in the state of California. And that's because uh, of the entrepreneurial spirit where people put everything on the line for riches and new beginnings. That's the spirit that finds the best of California, uh, that entrepreneurial energy, that innovative energy that continues uh, to be the envy of the world. People visiting here from around the globe saying, what is it? What is it about this state where you continue to punch above your weight? You continue to invent the future. You continue to outperform expectations. Um, and, uh, and that's highlighted in AI. It's highlighted in immunology. It's highlighted in quantum. It's highlighted across the spectrum of biotherapeutics and innovation. Uh, medical devices. It's, it's defined uh, by our partnerships with um, universities, uh, the research and development, uh, but it's also defined by the fact uh, that we get first-round job choices around the rest of the world. People come in from all around the globe because they feel seen and they feel included. And that's the final point I'll make for the Q&A. Our values continue uh, to allow us to thrive, and those values I believe, are foundationally intact, uh, despite some tough choices that we are making and proposing to make in this budget, uh, and despite uh, this short-term uh, adjustment. Uh, but if we move along the blueprint we're putting forward, we'll be back uh, where we need to be, and that is uh, back in the black. Uh, we'll be back um, on our feet as it relates to this budget, and uh, we'll continue to do nation-leading work across the spectrum. And, uh, and that requires partnership. And so, as I always do in this presentation, I look forward to working uh, with our speaker, look forward to working with the pro tem. Uh, our working relationship has been next level. Uh, I'm blessed uh, by their partnership. The early action is a demonstrable example of that. Uh, the relationships are, are, are sound. Uh, these are tough days, however, and I'm not naive. A lot of people have a lot of opinions, different opinions, and I welcome that. And I want to just repeat what I said in the outset. I look forward to working to adjust, to reconsider, to recalibrate. Uh, this is not etched in stone. Uh, this is not, uh, you know, this is not an Archimedes moment where we uh, put the staff in the sand, immovable, uh, but directionally, budget year plus one. We have to be mindful, not just of the short-term challenge, but we've got to address this ongoing issue, and to me, uh, that's an important line uh, that I believe we are aligned on, but I want to maintain uh, as we move forward in this budget negotiation. So that's the, the May revise, and we're here to answer any questions. Mr. Governor, it's Aton Wallace from Nexstar News Stations across California. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, first question right off the top. I'm trying to think about the average Californian out there. Right off the top, I know you were very clear in the January presentation about the following. No new taxes. Can you look all the cameras in the eye right now and guarantee no new taxes be between now and there, next year? There are no new taxes. I, I've not been one of those promoting taxes. Uh, I've been opposing taxes quite publicly. The last proposition was on the ballot. I invested millions of dollars uh, in ads to try to defeat that tax increase. We can achieve all of this. We can get our back on our fiscal sound footing without cutting core services, without uh, an additional tax increase. And I don't think that now is the time... Uh, particularly with the stacking of stress uh, over the course of the last few years with uh, 
costs that have risen as a consequence of uh, supply chain disruptions, as a cost of inflation, uh, to impose any additional burdens on the taxpayers along those lines. Thank you very much. And the second question here is uh, for our viewers from San Diego through Bakersfield, San Francisco, and all the way north to Wairika, everyone in between. Uh, Got to ask in the sense of in, in previous budget presentations, I remember you talking extensively about climate, homelessness, fire protection, a lot of key issues. I know you mentioned the HAP funding in this, but just in the sense of the average Californian, a lot of numbers here, a lot of different things, just to them on homelessness, on climate, fire, crime, education, what does this budget mean to them? We're holding the line on, on unprecedented investments in, in crime, retail theft. You're seeing progress in Bakersfield. Uh, you saw the CHP operations of Bakersfield to produce 211 arrests, 127 stolen vehicles that were recovered just in the first week of operation with the CHP. Uh, Today, the CHP is graduating 106 cadets, 1,000 new CHP officers. We're funded a multi-year commitment in the budget. We're maintaining that partnerships in Oakland. We've seen the reduction in crime in Oakland, about 33% uh, in the first quarter of this year. You saw the reductions that continue in San Francisco, property crime reductions in San Francisco, 32%, 14% decline in violent crime, uh, partnerships that we want to continue to advance, National Guard partnerships, on the border, addressing fentanyl, we want to continue to advance those partnerships. On the issues of homelessness uh, and housing, uh, we actually are increasing our low-income housing tax credit by $500 million in this budget. I could have had a separate presentation um, uh, to continue uh, our work in that space, to continue uh, to partner with cities and counties. You may have seen our latest um, Stance as it relates to one community, Half Moon Bay, on housing. We mean business. We mean business about the housing element. We mean business about meeting your state mandated goals. We want the cities and counties to follow the law. We'll continue in that space. Prop one on Tuesday, this goes to the issue of homelessness. We're going to be announcing in detail what we're doing very differently as it relates to the implementation uh, and the reforms as it relates to mental health and homelessness, uh, and I'm really encouraging you to tune in or participate uh, in that discussion as well. We've been uh, working uh, for months now, in anticipation of it passing, uh, weeks since its passage, to fulfill our promises that were made in that campaign. So across the spectrum of those top priorities in the state, we preserve our frame of focus. Uh, no fundamental uh, cuts in terms of the energy uh, and daring of sorts. I say daring because we're daring to do things radically differently in those space. Uh, but yes, there are programs that are component parts. You reference the bonuses under HAP. There are other component parts of our housing strategy where we are making adjustments, uh, but the core uh, mission remains firm and our commitment foundational. Hi, Lindsay Holden with Sacramento B. Um, following Aton's question, I, I have to push back a little bit when you say you can do everything because this uh, this. I, don't, I bother, just for the record, I don't recall ever saying I can do everything. I, well, let me finish. Uh, I just want to want to clarify. <laughs> yeah, let me finish my question. Okay. Wait, which is some of these cuts fall on the poorest Californians, while budget watchers have suggested changing the state's corporate tax rate. Why not consider something like that when some of these cuts will hurt Californians who have the least? Why? Well, I think we protect the vast majority of core services for existing programs in this state. We've done nation-leading work to expand those programs in the last few years, and we're preserving that. A perfect proof point of that is a full suite under the Medi-Cal system uh, that's been expanded uh, like no other state in U.S. history has ever expanded. Uh, so we are maintaining that. As it relates to uh, the 8.84% corporate tax, which is the highest, arguably, depending on how you want to analyze it in the country, uh, no, I'm not prepared to increase uh, taxes. Uh, we we have among the highest tax rates in the United States of America for high wage earners. Uh, we have among the highest tax wage rates, as I noted, uh, for corporate taxes. They were made higher by Donald Trump's tax increase uh, under the SALT deduction elimination, which I hope is eliminated by the federal government. Uh, but um, I, I feel strongly that we have to live within our means, within the framework of being more efficient and more effective uh, and uh, and do what a lot of other families and private businesses are doing. We're up to that task. I also wanted to ask, you're sponsoring a bill around changing RENA, the RENA categories to include, for cities to include homeless residents in their calculations, and yet your budget continues 
cuts to housing programs, how are cities supposed to build more housing to help homeless people if there's not more money to do that? Well, they, um, with respect, you'll hear more. I encourage you in particular to spend time with us on Tuesday, um, learn more about the details of what was just um, advanced and, and, and passed by the voters of the state of California under Prop 1 that provides an additional $1 billion on an annual basis to cities and counties specifically for housing to address the most vulnerable as you categorize them as homeless. A billion dollars that was otherwise not eligible under the Mental Health Services Act when it was originally conceived. That billion dollars uh, doesn't go in effect fast enough. There's an implementation phase. We'll be updating on that. But it also includes $6.38 billion of new housing money, unprecedented investments to deal with those that are uh, struggling fully diagnosed with drug or alcohol addictions, which also was not eligible under the previous Mental Health Services Act. So I beg to differ respectfully uh, with that categorization. Uh, there's more money in the bond than ever. There's more investment in terms of ongoing funding uh, for housing homeless than ever as a consequence of this reform, and we'll be updating you on that uh, on Tuesday. I just have to add, with all due respect, those types of housing that Prop 1 will fund there's a very limited number of the homeless people in California. Most of them won't apply for that kind of housing. They just don't have a place to live. How, what about those folks who aren't dealing with mental illness, addiction, et cetera? Well, I'd point to the $3.75 billion that we've invested in HomeKey, a program that didn't exist before we launched it and initiated it. I'd refer to your own headline in the Sacramento Bee on the success and efficacy of Project RoomKey, a component part of that, I would refer to you to the BCHIP program, $2.2 billion in behavioral health money uh, that we have advanced. I would refer to the prior package of $15.3 billion on homelessness and housing that we've incorporated, again, homeless component parts of housing, uh, as proof points to suggest that the totality of that frame needs to be considered. Hi, Governor. Um, I wanted to ask you about this proposal for a new budget account uh, that you mentioned. Is that something that you're going to be asking the legislature to pass in the coming weeks? And could you talk a little bit more about how exactly that would work? I, I know you did touch on some of the details, but I wasn't totally clear on all of those. I'm so. uh, two extraordinary experts that are eager to discuss further uh, the details of that. Man, it doesn't need to be introduced. He's, he's, this is the finance chair, if you didn't know. Yeah, Joe Stephenshaw, director of Department of Finance. Um, so, yes, it is a proposal that will be part of our May revision. We be, will be proposing trail bill language and um, hopefully working with the legislature over the coming weeks as we finalize the budget uh, to include it uh, in the final budget package. Essentially, what we're trying to do here, as the governor talked about, this um, inherent volatility uh, that we have in our revenue system and what we experienced, particularly over the last couple of years, when we when we look at our forecast and our uh, and the surpluses that are part of our forecast, portions of those sur surpluses are based on um, revenue that's expecting to come in over the upcoming budget year. So the um, general idea here would be to come up with a methodology to um, to uh, determine a growth in the forecast that is above historical levels of growth. Uh, a um, typical level of growth of, is 5% historically. So we would figure out uh, amounts in our forecast that are uh, above those historical level of growth and, and set aside in our budget plan um, a portion of that money and not spend it till it actually comes in uh, during that fiscal year. And then we would program it in the, in the budget for the, for the next fiscal year. I guess wh why is this needed, you know, beyond the uh, reserve funds that already exist? Why could you not change those to just be setting aside more money into, into the existing reserve accounts? So as a, the governor uh, stated earlier, we are still uh, having discussions with the legislature in terms of reforms of Prop 2 in, in AMLIS to save more money into the uh, budget stabilization account. Those are changes that have to go back to the voters. Uh, so this was not that will not replace those efforts. This is something that we think we can do uh, in the near term. That could be in addition, just another tool that we have to manage that volatility. Okay, and then just a, a question for the governor, since he invited it at the start of this press conference. Um, 
you know, you mentioned that you do think we should reform the tax system, but the how we do so is a more challenging and difficult question. What are the solutions that you personally would support in order to get to a more stable, long-term, uh, you know, revenue system in California? So on a probably annual basis, I discuss my long relationship with uh, former Senator Hertzberg, uh, who promoted uh, a lot of uh, ideas in the space, California Forward and uh, Think Long and Berggruen Institute and others that had offered strategies. And, I th and that's the broad approximation of the approach uh, that, uh, that I've long thought made sense. Um, there have been some more detailed uh, uh, legislative paths that didn't go very far uh, in the past. Uh, the Senator, to his credit, uh, asserted them. Th these are tough issues. And there's certain things, you know, that um, continue to promote that are difficult to actually achieve. And uh, including, by the way, getting the voters to where they need to be to reform uh, Proposition 2, uh, which is an enormous undertaking. And that's why we don't want to wait to achieve that goal without addressing an interim concern. And that's the idea of this account. So that's, that's where I've long been, um, long promoted. Um, and, uh, you know, I just think the last few years under underscore the, the volatility again is uh, it, unless we have other um, uh, structural reforms it's going to continue to vex many subsequent administrations and legislators hi governor blake jones with politico um you know i know that in this budget um kind of unusually uh you are addressing uh, these two years of deficits uh, which you haven't done before but there are still several delays being added and you know a couple of pretty massive spending deferrals that you've kind of already proposed one is this um you know eight billion dollar education funding maneuver that would have the state basically pay back um you know money through 2028 2029 when you're out of office also, in the early action agreement that you negotiated with the legislature, um, you know, you endorsed a payroll deferral in 2025 that's over a billion dollars. So, you know, I guess my question is, with all of those additional delays and deferrals, do you, is there still a risk that you're kicking some of the financial problems uh, down the road? Well, I guess there's a risk. But look, instead of 13.2, we're taking 4.2 the reserves to sort of hold some prudence. Um, and, and, and to be a little bit more rigid and structured where we are addressing the out year. You get two, three, four years out. You, I think it's a, I think it's, I think you start, frankly, everybody gets misled because you're, you're really speculating. It's too speculative to your question. It's the right question, but doing what we need to do this year and next year and how we balanced it. I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's reasonable. And again, no one's going to, this is a, this is a sizable deficit. I mean, no one's suggesting nothing's occurred here and there's nothing to see. Quite the contrary. Um, you're right uh, to reference. It was well over a billion on that payroll. Um, uh, those two examples. Uh, so, you know, we'll work through them. Uh, on, the, on the 98, I just, you know, Don, I want to see education cuts right now. I want to see us preserve the progress we've made on community schools, on preschool, uh, an after school for all, summer school for all, the work we're doing. Um, that's again, nation leading in, in the education space. I want to maintain that. So yeah, there are, there's, uh, that, that's all subject to um, kind of debate and discussions we're going to be having with the legislature. But this two year process, I think is prudent, long overdue, and, um, and uh, we stand ready to defend it. The language you've used to denounce tax increases often has been that you don't want broad-based tax increases. You talked about not wanting corporate tax increases, but you know there have been things around the edges, such as the MCO tax expansion that you uh, you know signed last month. Um, are there other tax and fees that could generate more revenue and uh, solve for this that are being considered by the legislature or others well, that they, you're comfortable they, they, with? Right now, this is uh, what I'm comfortable with. I just presented, um, and uh, we've adjudicated and considered many different. Alternatives. The MCO is a very different process, as you know, with CMS and waivers and partnerships and uh, and and drawing down federal funds, et cetera. Uh, but uh, no, I do not support uh, general tax increases. Period. And you're you're not comfortable with any other revenue generating um, you know provisions. Uh, this I think year. we need to be more efficient. I think we need to level set and align our revenues and expenditures. We're going back to our historic uh, revenue, um, uh, the more typical and historic revenue growth. Uh, and I think it would be wise to temper uh, any enthusiasm uh, for the more is always better frame.
and that's referring to taxes. Good morning, Governor. Travis Gilmore with the Epoch Times. There's been a lot of uncertainty about the depth of the deficit. The LAO projected $73 billion. Is the actual number we're solving today, if we take the 27.6 plus the 17.3 plus the $20 billion in solutions they said were included in the January proposal, are we solving about $65 billion? Yeah, let, let's go to the, I uh, appreciate this. And uh, we, we've got a slide here. We can get it up um, on the LAO and the DOF, which is Department of Finance projections. Uh, you can see this is the delta. I, I, I cautioned everyone. I failed miserably, not to run with that seventy-three million dollar figure, but but billion. But everybody, yeah, it just it's sort of repeated as gospel across the country. Um, if you include the totality of January in the revision, um, our, our projected shortfall is at forty-four point nine. Um, again, that's not the budget problem today, but that if you add those two up, so there is a delta between their projections and ours, and foundationally in, in this I could there could be 25 pages um, to be fair um, that's where the difference lies um, on different projections on revenue different approaches to prop 98 revenues impact on prop 98 uh, how you address 98 and then just work workload which is another fancy way of saying expenditures uh, and SFEU is uh, that safety account that that uh, that basically surplus account checking account of sorts so that's the difference. Um, they will have, and they continue to have their point of view. We respect them. We have a great working relationship with the LAO, um, and, and we learn a lot from their insights and thoughts, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we have outstanding dialogues, and, and we hope they uh, 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 learn from finance team, which is all assembled here. Job well done, everybody, by the way. Thank you. Uh, Joe, in particular, and Erica, uh, we appreciate all your hard work on this. So uh, that relationship you know, is, is outstanding, but, but this is the difference. And, uh, we just, um, we never anticipated that number to, uh, to be accurate. And, uh, uh, our numbers suggest something radically differently. And then can we explain to Californians how we moved from a hundred billion dollar surplus to such a significant deficit in just a matter of a few years? Well, it's, uh, yeah, we can explain it. $349 billion of unprecedented capital gains, 11.6%. Uh, when traditional capital gains is around 5.18% on average. It's almost double. So you have massive volatility. You have requirements under Prop 2, the GAN. You have requirements under Prop 98, which require that set aside. We use 93% of our surplus, which is, I want to be careful, um, either on the higher end or without precedent for one-time purposes. So we anticipated, because we didn't want that surplus to go to ongoing commitments, we anticipated that shortfall. Um, what we didn't anticipate is these rain bombs in December, January, February, and March, uh, these atmospheric rivers that led to a federal declaration that led to FEMA and the IRS moving in a direction where we couldn't collect our taxes until I believe November 16th as opposed to April 15th. And so therein lied this blackout period that uh, beguiled all of us, the LAO, finance, economists, experts. And interestingly, I mean, who's been at the White House recently, uh, had an impact um, in terms of the IRS collections as well with their estimates because there were other states that had similar delays in their taxes related to weather events, if there was any indication that climate change uh, has impacts well beyond those that are often promoted, uh, I would consider uh, our financial delays as just another example of why we need to tackle them. Another reason I'm looking forward to um, uh, conversations um, that we'll be having next week in this space. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Hey, Governor. <clears throat> well, I haven't talked in a while. <clears throat> Angela Hart, um, KFF Health News. Um, thank you. <clears throat> I have a um, recently the state auditor found um, that California wasn't doing a great job on tracking its homelessness spending. And um, this isn't a gotcha question. Um, you're doing more than any other governor in the country, really, to, to address this crisis. So I have a two-parter for you. Um, do you acknowledge, Governor, is your administration doing enough? Um, to determine whether the money that's being plowed into homelessness is being well spent. 
Um, and and do you worry? I'm curious. Do you worry that the appetite is souring among the public for for spending more, given the lack of progress that's happening? No, I appreciate the question and the frame. Uh, it's 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 the right question. It's the one I ask myself all the time. As you know from the audit, uh, one of the, the vaccine issues that was highlighted in the audit was local uh, appropriations, local data collection, and it's difficult uh, at the state level. Um, I say it often, localism is determinative, and, uh, and each city and county has different strategies and approaches. We've tried to level set that to your subsequent question about doing enough. As you know, a few years ago, we required accountability plans before we submitted at least one of the discretionary portions, the HAP program, uh, uh, to cities and counties and CACs. Um, I rejected the first plans because I didn't think there was enough transparency and accountability and ambition. Uh, we supported uh, the last plans. I also acknowledge that we need to do more, not just in the homeless bucket, but also the mental health slash homelessness bucket. That's why Proposition 1 had subsequent reforms as it relates to requirement by July of 2026 uh, to have one single plan for all funding sources for mental health uh, at the local level with more transparency, auditing, and oversight, again, of local spend. So that audit didn't surprise me in the least, quite the contrary. Also, third, and this is really important, um, Angela, you know this well, but for others perhaps don't, um, we also promoted, and I couldn't be more proud of uh, Member Ward introducing just a few days ago, um, the proposal to take the framework of our housing accountability uh, unit, which by the way has unlocked 23,000 housing units in the state. I'm really proud of their work. Um, and to connect a homeless component uh, into that accountability framework, which I think is deeply in the spirit and the zeitgeist of what the, uh, the audit uh, uh, was uh, at least showcasing. And so that's another tool uh, we hope we are able to have if the legislature embraces it in the next uh, few weeks. I'm sorry, Governor, I didn't hear responses to either of those questions um, about whether uh, this is state money ultimately i understand it goes to the counties but do you acknowledge whether the money that the that the state isn't doing enough to ensure that the money is being well spent i also didn't hear a response to whether you think that there's any i mean is the public appetite do you think i'm hearing this like souring towards putting more money into the cri i didn't hear responses to either of those well um, and, and forgive me I'll, 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 uh, if i appear to repeat the first response so the audit did not surprise me. Uh, the state has advanced uh, unprecedented investments, you're correct, and unprecedented interventions demanding more accountability with state money at the local level. That's why we created a framework for the state first state plan under the HAP money. The fact that I rejected it in many ways is implicit in response to the question. I rejected it for a reason around the issue of lack of accountability in terms of ambition and in, uh, in terms of what was presented uh, in that first plan. The fact that we're creating a housing accountability unit or created one and we want to incorporate homelessness into that also is implicit in response to your question about the need to do more around state money. Uh, and the other work we did with Proposition 1 to foundationally reform an existing stream of funding uh, to provide more transparency and state oversight of the local spend, again, is a third, I think, uh, reinforcement uh, of uh, my acknowledgement uh, about the need to uh, see more accountability and why I agreed, as I said, with many of the recommendations and was not surprised, as I noted, uh, with the audit itself. As it relates to uh, the public mood, no question. Uh, more is not always better. People want, you know, they want to see results. I've been very crystal clear about that. I've uh, been focused, as you know, particularly on the results we want to see on the streets and sidewalks and tents and the issues around encampments. Uh, that's why those encampment resolution grants we think are a national model. Uh, also been very insistent that we need to move some barriers uh, in terms of engagement uh, as it relates to accountability and results at the local level, as it relates to the grants passed and the amicus brief we filed with the United States Supreme Court. So all those are demonstrable responses, not rhetorical, but demonstrable responses uh, to both components of your question. Thank you. That was, <clears throat> that was extremely thorough. Thank you. Um, my second question, um, Governor, I think it's only been two years 
not even quite since you passed a historic um, uh, funding increase for California's extremely underfunded public health system. Um, uh, $300 million ongoing. Um, it looks to me that this is completely being wiped out in your budget proposal. Um, meanwhile, I mean, as you well know, climate change is upon <laughs> the, 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 the threats, the, the public health threats that come with climate change are enormous, where there's a really big concern right now about bird flu um, and dairy supply. I mean, it's really the, the, I guess my question for you is, what do you say to people, to the public who worries that defunding public health at this critical juncture further, further opens up California to, and, and really the globe, to public health and pandemic threats, which, um, you know, the pandemic has a, additional financial disasters, which in some ways put us where we are today. Yeah, look, um, we have a shortfall. We have to be sober about the reality, what our priorities are, unprecedented expansions in terms of uh, the Medicaid system here in the state of California under Medi-Cal, unprecedented investments in the health and human service space, unprecedented. Uh, we have no peers as it relates to the investments we've made. Uh, this is a program uh, that uh, we wish we could continue to absorb and afford. Uh, obviously, we'll have the opportunity to discuss this with the members of the legislature and make a determination uh, before it lands on my desk uh, whether or not that program or other programs should be considered in relationship to the need to balance not just this year's budget but next year's budget as well. Hi, Governor. Kayla Muller with CBS News here in Sacramento. Um, how will you measure success for this model of budget year plus one? You mentioned earlier that this could become the new normal. So what does success look like to you that it will indeed become the new normal? Well, I, look, I, I think it should. Uh, that's the way I, I, I'm, I'm promoting a different paradigm of consideration and thinking we'll, we'll see where it lands with the legislature. We've had some really good conversations, though, with key staff, and uh, we're encouraged uh, by their willingness to express a willingness to engage in this. And, and I think under the circumstances the last few years, uh, there's, there's ample evidence as to the why. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we could do that. In my previous roles and executive um, positions, we, we've adopted similar strategies. We've codified that in statute um, to the extent uh, this is an effective uh, 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 relationship in terms of our thinking and with the legislature, uh, that may be a consideration in the future. I'm not promoting that at the moment, but but that's my mindset, and uh, it's a mindset that I expect, uh, subject to external uh, uh, circumstances, but I would expect to continue to adopt in my remaining three uh, uh, sessions. That said, um, you know, it's hard to look beyond. Uh, budget year plus one, as I noted earlier, because of so much volatility and uncertainty. But I do think it's important that uh, we have a, a, a medium-term uh, mindset. We have multi-year budgets, as you know, with projections, which are also important, that didn't exist in the past. Uh, those provide you some understanding of what uh, to anticipate in the future, but it's very difficult on the basis of the macroeconomics. And in this revision, um, programs are being put on pause. So how are you going to ensure that they will indeed resume and that not year after year that they're getting forgotten about? Well, you can go to, I think it's on the eight pages that we provided you, and I'm making this up, but if I'm right, there'll be another one of those salads from January. Uh, that on the, the bottom of page nine, I think there's a headline that says triggers, and it's the top of page 10. Uh, and there are, I think, seven specific trigger items um, that are, are bulleted. Um, and, 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 and their triggers as it relates to things we've worked with the legislature formally to prioritize if and when the money comes, we would prioritize these things first. And that's a similar process that will unfold, I imagine, based on past uh, with the legislature as it relates to these delays. What are our top priorities if and when the resources avail of themselves? And so we'll have that similar mindset. It's been uh, a, a proposition uh, that we've advanced in the past. It's more difficult when you're looking at the two-year to assign um, 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 uh, the, the moment within that budget frame. Uh, but that's, that's the approach I would take to rebuild uh, some of these programs that by definition we all supported. Again, these are budgets I signed. What is out here? Every question you're asking is spot on. Why this? Well, because we have a math problem. Um, is this what I want to do? No. 
But the alternative, you know, we can we can eliminate our expansion of, of health care. We can eliminate uh, wages. We can eliminate, we can do furloughs. We can do layoffs. We can do a lot of things. I don't want to do those things. So these are the things that in the absence of those other things that, you know, are difficult to do. And so triggers provide that pathway. And those are examples of triggers in the past. And there'll be more triggers, I imagine, in the future as it relates to this budget as well. Thank you. Hello, Mackenzie Mays with the LA Times. Um, there is no info about 525, the health care minimum wage in this budget. Can you update us where those negotiations are? We're going to get it done. This budget will not be signed without that deal that we committed to being addressed. Uh, and I believe there's a trigger in January, and then we are working to address it in July. And Dana Williamson is the point person for this, my chief of staff, who's done an outstanding job on the budget. Uh, she's under deep duress that I pointed her out and this issue out in relationship to her responsibility and stewardship and leadership uh, to fulfill the core tenets of what was committed to. But that will get done uh, before the budget. Can you give us a hint uh, about what the holdup is? Like, will worker should workers be no, expecting to not get that? Uh, one of the one of the things I've learned the hard way is uh, talking too publicly about a process that's unfolding in real time, and so. Uh, know that uh, that will reveal itself in very short order, as we stated it would within uh, this uh, uh, fiscal year, and uh, and we maintain that status and, and and we maintain that expectation. How do you sort of navigate that, especially when people are talking about transparency in the Capitol right now? Why is it, you know, what what does the public, um, what do you owe the public? I guess, especially workers who are concerned that they're not going to get this money. Well, like the same posture of expression that I did in January on this. When I signed the bill, you can read my signature related to the bill and and, uh, and the commitment that I just made to you and reinforced today that it will get done before the end of the fiscal year. You had said you had some concerns about it then. Can you explain a little bit more? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna and I'm gonna say res with respect and I appreciate um, I appreciate um, the work you've done on this and, and the articles and, and I think it's really important and um, and I thank you for that. Um, we've got a few weeks uh, to land this, and uh, I want to land it in a way that uh, works for everybody and fulfills the commitments we made. And, and that's just my responsibility, um, and uh, I just want to leave it at that at this moment. If I okay, know. I'll move on. I appreciate sort it. Sort of. Um, <laughs> sorry. Do you think this wage, um, industry-specific wage hikes, are the way to go, and would you support a higher minimum wage for all? Well, I, we have one of the highest minimum wages country in the state of California I've long support it local level not just at the state level and sectoral bargaining is something obviously we embraced as it relates to a one industry that we think was disproportionately under uh, undervalued um, and under supported uh, but at this moment I'm not promoting any additional uh, ideas I'm trying to address uh, the acuity of the enormity of the task in front of us uh, nothing is on my desk or nothing that's pending in terms of a promotion in that space uh, imminent uh, from this administration. Okay, and just a logistical question. Uh, today's a little bit different than past May revises. Usually the budget doc is like hundreds of pages. Today's is less than 50. Um, are we expecting like a, a May revise part two to come or is this it? No, you get with all the, I think everybody has all the details, the LAO and everybody, and you got hundreds of backups and you could talk to, talk to, talk to the experts here, talk to the printing press folks. Hi, Governor. This is Adam Beam with the Associated Press. Um, the LAO called your proposal to um, address the $8 billion difference in the Proposition 98 minimum guarantee. Um, they called that bad fiscal policy. They said it would be, you know, kicking the deficit down the road. Uh, are, you, are you still committed to that in this, in this budget and why? Clearly. Um, and it's 8.8 .8 now. Well, why, why are you committed to doing it that way? Well, because I want to maintain the commitments in terms of the investments we've made, which I think are incredibly important. I don't want to see thousands and thousands of pink slips go out. I don't want to see the disruption in the system. Um, Joe and the team could talk more about some of the technical side. As I said, you need not only a Ph.D., but you need a uh, you know, physics degree and engineering degree and everything else related to Prop 98 to unpack its complexities, Adam. And, I know you know enough about that over the years, uh, but we respectfully disagree with, with, uh, with that position. 
Uh, on the slide earlier, it, it mentioned about a $500 million one-time cut for water storage. Yeah. I know that you've been a big proponent of the uh, Delta Conveyance and uh, Sites Reservoir. That, would this cut impact either of those projects? When, uh, nothing directly related to our number one climate resilience program, and that's the Delta Conveyance, uh, nor uh, to the work we're doing to fast track through the first judicial review process related to our permitting reforms uh, sites, the first above ground off stream storage facility in the immediate. And that money has been sitting there, uh, but will not be drawn down for some time. So we looked at the timelines on that so we don't see any direct impact. You can argue there's an indirect. I'm mindful of that. Also, as I noted, mindful of the old Prop 1 and the $2.7 billion and what's been set aside. I'm also mindful of what others may not be mindful of, and that's the work we're doing with the feds in this space, and also mindful of other ideas we have in relationship to sites uh, to keep that project uh, moving forward and to get this project done. So, no, I'm very eager to see both complete, uh, but it's the right question in relationship to sites more than it is to the Delta conveyance, and we have some ideas that will um, uh, be pursuing uh, to address whatever anxiety may uh, be there. But in the short run, we don't feel there's any real concerns. And finally, uh, you, you mentioned that you feel like this, um, the budget, the revenues, declines, and everything that we've experienced, you've, you've characterized it as a, a return to normal, like historic norms, mm -hmm. and that, you know, what was happening previously was, was not normal, you know, this crazy amount of budget yeah. surplus infusions we had. So if that's the case, do, do you regret decisions made previously, spending decisions on that when we yeah. had all this money? Should we have been more prudent in saving and saving? Ninety-three percent. I mean, uh, setting aside ninety-three percent. I remember I had a slide. You remember a May revise? I said I wanted ninety-nine. You all laughed. And I said, well, if I can get anywhere near 90, I think historically, even Brown during those years, and fiscal conservative, I don't think he broke 89 percent. So, no, we, we, we knew this was coming, Adam. And that's why we set aside these one-time programs that we can claw back or extend or promote from a five years to seven or three years to five or one year to two years. So, no, we, we are very sober. And if you go back to those presentations, you'll see me very open about, uh, about that anxiety. So, no, we, we had tapped out on our reserves. We had a GAN issue that provided $18.1 billion of tax uh, relief. Uh, we had $600 reliefs to people earning, you know, under SSI, SSP. We, uh, you know, we provide a lot of support at the time people needed the money. You had the Prop 98 guarantees. You're paying down pension obligations. So you look across the panoply and 93% and feel uh, like we were doing the best we could under that circumstance. Hi, Governor. Sophia Bolag here from the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, as you're well aware, student protesters across the country, including at public Universities here in California are calling for their in universities to divest from companies that do business with Israel in light of the war in Gaza. What's your response to those protesters? I don't support divestment. What, do you have a reaction to the agreement that the leadership at Sac State has made with the protesters well, there? I, and, and on that, Sophia, interestingly, and this is not to deflect, um, I actually am going to learn more about that in a few hours because I read one thing on this thing called Instagram. Uh, and then I was told something very different uh, by a member of my staff, and those two things need to be squared so I can answer your question. So follow back up with us in a few yes, hours. Yes, would, would love to follow up Thank about you. that. Um, also wanted to ask you um, about uh, the... Not that I'm on Instagram a lot. I just someone <laughs> sent that to me. Um, also wanted to ask you about That's energy funny. bills. Um, there's obviously a lot of controversy um, with the, the budget that was passed last year and the, the flat rate, rate hike. Um, there's some discussions in the legislature of, of passing something that uh, would change that. Is there any bill that lawmakers might send you that you would support to, to make changes to that well, policy? I, I, I think what PUC broadly did was codify the, the bill that they did sign and send to me a few years ago as it relates to the flat rate. It just came down a much lower number than I think some had feared and some had promoted the IOUs in particular. It's along the lines of, um, I think, SMUD, in fact, the, the same exact number roughly. Uh, we're aligning with what other, many other states are doing all across the United States as well. And we're aligning with our values and our promotion around per unit costs of electricity, electricity to promote uh, this transition to green energy. Uh, and not to disincentivize people from moving into heat pumps and uh, getting electric vehicles and 
uh, moving to electrification broadly, including solar. So uh, we think it uh, was prudent under the circumstance, uh, but it's changed. Now, as it relates to the utility costs more broadly, I want to remind everybody, if you haven't, you will see an adjustment on your bill. Uh, tens of millions of people, at least, uh, well, maybe I'm overstating tens of millions, but millions, will see an adjustment on the bill of $146 uh, in April from last month, and you'll see another one, $146 adjustment in October as it relates to offsets to the utility bill that come from our nation leading cap and trade program, cause and effect. Uh, we're also working uh, across the spectrum uh, uh, other strategies as it relates to uh, addressing the costs of uh, utilities. And so I'm mindful of that issue. I was going to spend more time on that today. I was going to was get a little off topic with the May revise, uh, but I assure you we'll be talking a lot more about this issue like we will homeowner insurance as well. Uh, mindful of, of the anxiety that people are feeling. So if, if lawmakers were to send you a bill, are you saying you, you would or would not be an automatic veto on well, I, I don't, changes? I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know me. I, I'm not. A, I'm going to read a bill. I don't want to say I'm going to sign anything. I need to see what they're talking about. They send me a bill as it relates to um, this issue a couple years ago. I did sign it, and we uh, we advanced it. So if they have some new ideas or want to undo the old one, uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pay attention as I do to the how many bills this year? Just 2,000 other bills. Uh, and it's not a knock. It's not a cheap shot. Look forward to uh, reviewing as many bills uh, that appear to be progressing as possible, just not big tax increases. Hi, Governor. Ashley Zavala with KCRA3. Uh, the California Supreme Court is set to make a determination on whether the Taxpayer Protection Act gets on the ballot. And amid this discussion of volatility and taxes and reform just what from the state's perspective is you that, that you find the biggest threat with this act should it pass should voters approve it and 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 forgive me but i hope you you really do appreciate it, it would be if if i'm gonna dodge on a hypothetical about a bill that i haven't seen in print or a bill that may be in print that i haven't reviewed in relationship to the issue of utilities, I want, to, I want to be careful about actually discussing something that's in front of the Supreme Court as we speak um, and, and, and be careful about uh, uh, expressing anything more than what was expressed by not only myself but former Governor Brown and others as it relates to the filing, which details my concern about that initiative. I will just for broad strokes purposes, remind you of something that is not often in print, and that's the retroactivity that's a separate and above from the legal question. But the retroactivity of 100 plus already approved local measures, the impact that would have would be felt and outsized and make a lot of the conversation we're having today significantly and materially different. So I just, I caution that as a part of the sort of punditry on this, I hope people really look through uh, what that could mean. Again, separate and above from the legal questions in front of the California Supreme Court. Okay, separate separate from that. Um, and I know I know this question exhausts you, but I ask because I know this is the start of a give and take oh, yes. with the legislature. Good. and And I don't think any of us would be surprised if one or two or a group of Democratic lawmakers came to you and said, we'd like to raise taxes on X, Y, Z. So is it is it no. fair to say that it is an absolute non-starter yeah. for you? Yeah, look, look. Again, I'm not ideological. I'm open to argument. I'm interested in evidence. But I don't see there's real evidence and need right now to increase general taxes in the state and put more burden on working folks um, and, 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 and our competitive posture. So no, uh, I would have laid that out if I believed that. And I did not. Uh, I do not believe we need that this year or next year, and um, and so I will not be promoting, um, and will not be supporting, subject to some random act of God. And having experienced a disproportionate number of those in five years, uh, I add that as an asterisk. Okay, so you will not be convinced. <laughs> well, no. The answer is no. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how many times I can say no to the tax question. But everyone thinks, you know, anytime you do anything, you add a fee, then it's a tag. I get it. So everyone's just, you know, I, 
Yeah, I've been doing this too long. Anyway. Hi, so. Governor. Andrew Oxford from Bloomberg. You mentioned wanting a trailer bill on homeowner insurance. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about what you want to see in there and why you want that before the insurance commissioner is complete? Is well, I, I just I want to see things. Right Here's the spirit of what I want to see. We got to move this process along. Here's my humble uh, submission point of view. Uh, we can't wait till December. Can't. That said, I deeply mindful, intimately deeply mindful, of how hard the staff is working over there, uh, how difficult this task is, um, and I'm very grateful to the insurance commissioner for his willingness to engage in this process and his deliberativeness uh, in terms of the reforms he's promoting, but it has to come sooner. So we're promoting a 60-day process uh, of review. Uh, it should not take this long for emergency regs. Um, I am almost of the temptation to do an additional executive order, uh, but under the circumstance, I think working with the legislature on a trailer bill is more appropriate, but we've got to move this process along. 60-day process of review for? For the reg, um, for, for the, the rate review. For the rates. Uh, and then also, I don't have the full details in front of me, so can you talk about the Air Resources Board? Are you expecting that they will be funded to implement SB 253 uh, on the time frame that's outlined in the law? I'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. They should have the resources, but uh, let, me, let me get back to you on the specifics related to CARB's relationship to that bill in terms of staffing. I think there was a big staffing request. We think they can find those resources to achieve the same goal uh, without the magnitude of that request being fulfilled, or at least the numeric. Uh, but I'll get some more detail, and, and, uh, but not at the level they originally wanted. We're going to have a separate conversation. It's funded in the it's funded in the budget. I just don't want you to come back and say it wasn't their original. They had uh, maybe I know this is what happens when you're, you do this for a living. There was an original proposal where I'm like, guys, you know, this is this was too much of an ask. They got the they ultimately compromised and they got the they got the budget is the answer. Thanks. There you go. Not to lay the air resources board out. <laughs> Sorry, that was uh, that was to chair Randolph and looking in the camera. Hi, Governor. Jamie Kennedy from Spectrum News. You talked about pausing childcare expansion slots. You also said everyone's doing it leaner at the moment, so the state government has to. But if everyone who's already at the vulnerable stage has to do it leaner um, and they were expecting a childcare slot, what do you say to the families that were hoping to get into something like this? Well, that we have more work to do, and we've been doing more than I imagine we could do three years ago. I mean, if the idea that we had a 200,000, I remember we called it a stretch goal a couple of years ago. Then it was 100,000. And then I said, we'll do 150. And then we went back, maybe we can achieve this 200,000. So I would tell them our resolve remains firm, but reality, check. We don't want to take away an existing slot, 119,000. We're going to protect that. Um, and we chose, and again, the legislature may have a different point of view. They may say, well, we don't, we want to sacrifice the wage. I don't believe that's the right thing to do. But they may say we want to sacrifice the wage increase because slots become more important. I think that would be a mistake, but, but we may be able to find some other common, uh, common strategy um, because I, I maintain firm in my desire to see that goal is what I would tell those, those families. And with CalWORKS, um, with the reductions you said, I believe on the administrative side of things, with more people needing more um, from CalWORKS because more people are doing it tough, if you're putting any more strain on that, won't um, that also? Not much strain. That's an administrative function at the county level. That's not a direct impact. The COLA remains firm in the budget. And I'll remind you, since I've been here, 10% in 2019. In January, we did a 13.1%. On top of that later, you saw other incremental increases, including the COLA uh, that we're holding today. So CalWORKS is not being cut in that respect. This is an administrative function at the county level. All right, thank you. And then thank just you. lastly, state of the state, when can we expect that? Yeah. Why is it taking so like long? I feel like we've just finished it today uh, <laughs> uh, as we're going off topics. Uh, looking forward to, it's just it's finding the time and the space with the legislature. And we've met with legislative leaders on two occasions and uh, we were running around with uh, certain dates. So I'm glad you care. <laughs> You're the first person. <laughs> it was so good last year. Yeah, God bless. Yeah, thanks.
Hey, Governor, Becca Habiger with ABC 10 News. I want to circle back to the added urgency to the already urgent homeowners insurance yeah. affordability and availability crisis. Yeah. I'm wondering whether uh, you and Commissioner Lara have been speaking with insurance companies to get reassurances that if A, then B, if the state expedites the rate request approval process, if that forward-looking modeling actually gets on board sooner rather than later, then these companies will come back and write once again yes fully. Yes and yes and yes. Hmm. That's why I'm moving forward with this trailer bill. Let's go. Let's so you're hearing from along. them. We've been meeting with everybody on this. Strong opinions about time to uh, this process, I mean, time to decision-making on on resolving these open-ended questions around reinsurance, around uh, guaranteeing insurance within the WUI, guaranteeing that people come back in the market, the rulemaking, all of the above, all the things that were laid out in the executive order, all the things that the insurance commissioner himself has very publicly pronounced in advance, all the things that a lot of the insurers themselves have been promoting with, again, deep mindfulness of Prop 103, deep mindfulness of those that have consumer uh, concerns, and maintaining that price balance, but availability price, that finding that, that, uh, that, that balance. But time is important in terms of the rate decision making, and that's what we're promoting uh, as a short-term step and continue to promote the larger package uh, in partnership uh, with the insurance commissioner. And undoubtedly, December, as you mentioned, is already an expedited process. But what would you say to the average homeowner who, all over California, I'm thinking of folks I've talked to in the foothills who say, look, I'm retired, I'm on a fixed income, I simply can't possibly live in California for much and longer. I'm with them. That's why we're doing the trailer bill. I'm with them. That's why I did the executive order. Um, uh, I, I could not, um, I can't impress upon them more the, the urgency uh, that we share together uh, to move this process along. I'm also deeply mindful of the burdens have been placed and the stress on the fair plan and, um, and just full disclosure, uh, participant in the fair plan in the foothills. So uh, to those specific individuals, uh, we share uh, similar uh, experiences as well. Mm. Uh, final question. Um, I'm taking a page out of Aton's uh, book over there. Uh, so, as you are well aware, I'm sure yesterday rumors were swirling that this May revise could include furloughs. Obviously, that is not the case. But to the 240,000 state workers, uh, can you state explicitly that your proposal does not include furloughs? There are no furloughs. There are no layoffs. Uh, we're not asking for wage cuts or concessions. We are asking for 7.9 percent efficiencies in this budget that will impact uh, our administration, uh, and, uh, and we are looking to sweep those vacant positions, vacant uh, positions going forward, which total roughly 10,000. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's Laurel Rosenhall from, this, from the LA Times. Um, I just was wondering if you could address the question of bonds. Obviously, there's oh, yeah. proposals floating around in the legislature. And how did your own experience with Prop 1 <laughs> shape your yeah. you know, re re rece receptiveness to any uh -huh. bonds that might um, yeah. well, happen a... this year? Do you want any? <laughs> yeah. um, so um, there are three parallel conversations that are taking shape. You can argue four or five, but three uh, that are core conversations around three different topics, climate issues related to housing and schools. Uh, there are proposals and there's desire from members of the legislature to promote one, two, or all three. Those conversations uh, continue. I uh, met with many of the caucuses over the course of the last few weeks to have more granular conversations and continue to meet with leadership. Our teams are meeting at staff level with leadership uh, about where we are. As you know, on the school bond in particular, there's a component part as it relates to housing uh, and general fund impacts that must be considered. The questions there, as you know, also remain around should higher education be included or should they not? As it relates to climate, we were able to substantially protect the climate budget, as was promoted in January, plus we've received, and this is an update from January, now $15.9 billion from the federal government. Uh, that is substantially higher than we even projected in January of additional funds that have come uh, to enhance our larger, our largest subnational climate uh, budget. Uh, on the issue uh, of housing, ongoing discussions, key legislative leaders. Uh, that uh, care deeply about that space. So we, we, we're we maintaining a posture of engagement. We'll make a determination. We'll look at the bond thresholds overall. We'll look at the long-term costs of those bonds as it relates to absorbing more uh, of the general fund. 
And as it relates to the issue of March and the experience we had, uh, I'm mindful that March experience is very different than a November experience. Uh, but yes, even that experience of March sobered, uh, I think, a lot of the conversation up here uh, about uh, where people are. And it goes to, I think, uh, one of the questions was asked earlier about public's appetite. Um, and uh, the public wants to see results. They're not interested in inputs. They're not interested to talk about how much money we're spending. They want to see results. And they deserve results. And they demand results. And so when we're out there uh, promoting these bonds, we need to be mindful of that. And that's deeply, to your question, part of the conversation we're having with legislature. So how many of those three do you want to see on the November ballot? I'm working with the legislature in a process to see where the te- where they are and make a determination and um, and uh, we'll let you know. But um, we're, we're right now uh, working in partnership with the legislature to see where we land on these things and I have nothing more to say at this moment. So also related to the November ballot, um, but not on bonds. I mean, this next six weeks is kind of the season when a lot of deals get made in Sacramento to get things taken off the ballot. Um, are there measures that you are actively working to get taken off well, the I mean, ballot? I, apparently, Dana Williamson gave that up by smiling uh, right, right there. That's all. I can't tell you how many hours of the day we're, we're consumed. Uh, we're, the, you, it, it's, the, it's a very good question, a very thoughtful question. Uh, it's very accurate uh, that this is the season, uh, and we are uh, engaged in a number of advanced conversations. Uh, around uh, uh, around these initiatives, and uh, stay tuned. Any priority ones you really want to get off the ballot? Uh, at peril, once again, uh, of making the mistakes I used to make. I'm going to make new mistakes, but I don't want to make the same mistakes that I used to make of saying anything more would be imprudent at this mo- moment. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. And that is our last question. Well, with that, I want to say that concludes the state of the state, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> Now that there's interest, I may, I may defer. Uh, but let me thank you all again for um, uh, the opportunity. And, and, and let me just once again reinforce, this isn't without, uh, you know, these are difficult decisions. And I'm very mindful there's things we haven't discussed that will hit people hard. These deferrals mean a lot to a lot of people. There were expectations that were set over the course of the last few years. And unfortunately, we're not able to advance that on the basis of this new reality. And so I'm, I'm sensitive to that. I'm sensitive to those concerns. And it's a way of reinforcing that we look forward to engaging the legislature constructively to address these gaps, to address the concerns, to reappropriate, to reconsider, to reprioritize. Again, the vast majority of what I promoted here were things that in the past promoted as cuts or things in the past I've promoted uh, as investments. And so by definition, the posture is one of engagement uh, with the legislature in terms of addressing uh, their uh, particular concerns. Co-equal branch of government, deep gratitude uh, to the legislature uh, for their patience throughout this process. And we're looking forward to the next number of weeks. Thank you all very much. And with that, the real budget presentation is about to happen. Good afternoon again. Uh, First, would like to start by acknowledging all of the hard work that our department uh, has done to get us to this point. I can't express enough how much work it takes to um, present the governor's budget and the governor's May revision uh, to the legislature, particularly at the May revision when uh, we have to incorporate April tax receipts. We have from the end of April until this press conference to uh, deliver the May revision and the hardworking folks at uh, the Department of Finance work nonstop, day and night, to make that happen. I just can't express how much I appreciate that. Um, to Erica Lee, the Chief uh, uh, Deputy for Budgets for the department, uh, and the rest of the executive team, all the PBMs out here, uh, just want to acknowledge their work and thank them. Also would like to acknowledge and thank all of the work in partnership with the Governor's Office the staff and the uh, cabinet secretaries, agencies, and departments. This is obviously from the governor's uh, 
presentation has not been an easy budget, and um, it's been a real team effort within the administration to get to this point. I'd like to start by uh, adding a little bit of additional context to the governor's uh, uh, presentation. He did a fantastic job of outlining the, the pro pro proposal, uh, why we're taking the approach that we're taking, but I just want to highlight that at this time last year, there was significant uncertainty built into our revenue forecast, as the governor mentioned, and the approach we took at May rev Revision, and ultimately when we um, came to a, a deal on the 2023 Budget Act with the legislature, we ha held on to all of our reserves. We um, didn't t take real drastic uh, steps in either uh, way, uh, understanding that uh, there was that significant uh, uncertainty built in because of the IRS tax delay, and we wanted to wait and see, and we said at the time, um, how things shook out for the governor's budget. We didn't know at that time that the IRS would delay the tax uh, filing for 99% of the taxpayers in the state uh, further through November, um, but now here we are at the May revision, and we have um, a, a better understanding of what happened in terms of our taxes for tax year 2022 and now 2023, um, and we can see um, that we, as we had at the governor's budget, we've had a little bit of um, softening our revenue since the governor's budget, but not a huge swing, and we can see we still have these um, huge uh, shortfalls in the out years, and um, given all of that, know that uh, this is the time that we need to address those shortfalls in order to ensure that the state is able to protect the programs and services that uh, the residents of California rely upon. And I think it goes to some of the questions on, um, as the governor mentioned, this cut or that cut. Obviously, these are all tough decisions. We would don't want to be in this position to be here proposing cuts. Um, uh, as the governor mentioned, we tried to focus on protecting the core programs and services that people rely upon, but even in doing that, Tough decisions had to be had to be made, um, and this uh, uh, puts us in a place where, when we are building, when the Department of Finance starts working on the budget for next year in just a matter of months, we are not facing another shortfall. This is to uh, intention here to right size our budget so that we can then, um, in future budgets, uh, work on uh, advancing and building back up. Uh, all of the efforts uh, and and um, and programs that uh, programs and efforts that are underway, and I'll just uh, highlight uh, that that point um, uh, more finely. At the governor's budget, the budget year plus one uh, negative special fund for economic uncertainty, our our basically our operating reserve was uh, negative thirty three point one billion dollars, and so that meant, and we are required to have a positive balance there um, when we are uh, presenting and acting a budget. And so uh, that meant if uh, if we had a similar uh, budget or plus one at this time, that in a matter of months when we were heading into building next year's budget, we would be back at the drawing boards in terms of um, looking for solutions. And it would be tougher at that time because a lot of the solutions that we are utilizing now, including cuts that are hard, uh, would no longer be available at that point. And that is why it was important to really um, get back uh, uh, into balance, not only in the budget year, but in budget year plus, plus one. And as the governor mentioned, that is exactly what this budget does. And so uh, in addition to having a $3.4 billion uh, dollar, um, special fund for economic uncertainty balance in 24-25, which is a similar uh, balance that, uh, that we had at the, the Budget Act, we are we have flipped that 33 that negative 33.1 billion dollar balance in 25 uh, 26 to now be a positive 650 million dollar balance i also note kind of in the approach i know there's a question about uh delays deferrals that um that uh yes there were some that were included in the governor's budget but at the approach that we're taking at the may revision uh really minimizes additional delays and deferrals and um, really focus on um, aligning expenditures with revenues and bringing the budget back into balance. As far as the um, the uh, the eight pages, the document overview of the budget uh, that uh, folks received today, and I know the question about the size versus previous uh, versions, that the document today really reflects the, the approach that we're taking in the budget. 
where um, uh, we are, you know, the, the, this budget is about uh, uh, solutions uh, to uh, not only solve for, for the budget year, but the, the, um, the subsequent budget year. And uh, the eight pages highlight the major solutions uh, that get us there. And um, within a matter of an hour or so, uh, we will also be providing a detailed list of all of the solutions that are part um, of the May revision proposal. As the governor mentioned, there are a few hundred of them. Uh, uh, the major ones are in the eight pages, uh, but there are many minor uh, solutions, many of those uh, reductions that um, uh, we will post that list on our on our website. Um, the eight pages historically is uh, a document that is an overview of the high level uh, um, um, significant issues in the budget and is never comprehensive of everything in the budget. And we are providing that document today, so um, so it's available to the public on all of the uh, all of the solutions that are contained um, uh, in, in the budget in one place in in one document. Um, So when we the the when we uh, have the press conferences here and uh, the the information that we present is is we are presenting the information that we normally present um, with the May revise there are um, uh, backup documents that are provided to the legislature uh, and those will be uh, uh, provided by the May revise deadline which is uh, uh, Tuesday so. There will be some subsequent backup doc documentation that um, uh, goes to the, the legislature. It, um, that information is stuff that we typically provide, um, uh, and sometimes that rolls out uh, over a number of days. Uh, so there's not a change in, in terms of the uh, amount of information that's being provided or the process, and it will all be provided uh, by the May revision date of uh, Tuesday. No, no. Okay. Um, uh, lastly, I just want to just clear up one thing. The governor talked about the uh, prison closures. The the he was dead on on the amount, uh, the the savings for it. But four prisons closed uh, in eight uh, facilities uh, uh, in the last few years. Um, the uh, behavioral health uh, continuum inf infrastructure program. He mentioned the, uh, the amount that was provided for the program, which is accurate. But with the the solutions that uh, um, we uh, have proposed, uh, the uh, total amount of funding for that program is now 1.75 billion dollars. Uh, and uh, with that, I will open it up to questions. Hey, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for taking our questions again. It's Angela again from KFF Health News. Um, I had a question about, Joe, the um, last budget. It was approved, but because it's a federal Medicaid waiver, some of the funding streams, it hasn't actually gone through yet, I don't think, the transitional rent waiver through CalAIM. Are you familiar? Yes. Uh so there was a transitional rent waiver that went through the budget last year, although it's not in place yet. It was supposed to be done by the budget by this uh, the beginning of this upcoming fiscal year. Um, so do you know, ha has the state received approval, final approval from from CMS to do the transitional rent waiver? And if so, when does that start? Um, I, all I can say is there's no changes to the assumptions in our budget, and I think we're still on track. But um, uh, our uh, program budget manager uh, over our health programs can follow up with you. Great, great. Can I? Okay, great. Can I chat with you? Hi, sorry, just a quick question. Um, I'm Annabelle Sosa from the LA Times. I just didn't hear uh, what you had previously said about prison, and you said 1.5 billion. I just didn't catch the last few sentences you said. If you could. Oh, so I, I think the the governor mentioned a, a, an amount of, of savings from prison closures and facilities um, uh, over the last few years, going out through 2027, and that amount was 3.4 billion, and which he was uh, correct on the amount. However. The, the um, number of closures was four prisons with eight, uh, eight facility uh, closures. 
Hi, uh, Rachel Bluth, Politico. Um, can you explain what's going on with the MCO tax here? Um, it seems like so. So this six point seven billion over multiple years. That was is that from the the like per, the provider payment fund for the out years? Um, and does that mean that some providers are not going to be getting those planned rate increases? Will that be backfilled later? Can you kind of get into that a little bit? So um, there are, I think there are two um, uh, probably major MCO proposals. One's on the spending side, and that is uh, correct for the uh, rate increases that uh, have not gone into effect yet. Uh, the budget uh, assumes that those will not move forward. Uh, for uh, and then on the the for the rate increases that did go in effect uh, in in uh, this year, those are maintained. For um, on the revenue side, we're also uh, uh, assuming increased revenues uh, by adding uh, Medicare revenue to the calculation, something that we can do within the existing structure. Uh, it doesn't change uh, impact on the commercial health plans, and it's just something that we have to work with CMS to get approval for. Gotcha. So OBGYN... Um specialty mental health and primary care are still getting their planned increases that went into effect first, but the out years, which was supposed to be, um, you know, emergency care, um, ambulances, like a bunch of all, all those others there, none of yeah. them are happening. They are not moving forward in, uh, in the May revision budget proposal. Correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, Adam Beam with the Associated Press. Um, the governor mentioned something about ARPA interest being swept up. Can you explain what that is? Um, it's not not being swept up. It's just the the uh, the ARPA funds that the state had interest accrued, and we're uh, we're using uh, that interest to offset some uh, general fund expenditures. You know about how much that was? It's around two hundred sixty million dollars. Okay. And the, the net operating loss proposal, I know in January he wanted to limit it to, what, 80 percent, I think? And now, yes, that was the – So now the proposal is to go ahead and just suspend all of it. Is that – Yeah, so the, the proposal in January is to limit it to 80 percent going forward. The um, proposal at the May revision is uh, similar to the, uh, the um, proposal from 2020 that had the three-year pause. However, um, a couple – uh, modifications. Number one, it wouldn't begin until the 2025 tax year, so it's it wouldn't begin immediately. Uh, and uh, really, we look at it as beginning in the 2526 uh, budget. So there's a one-year delay on when uh, it would actually start. And we also are including a trigger that would trigger it off if our revenues um, performed at a, a level that allowed us to do so. Okay, but is is the eighty percent thing still take? So this, this would year? replace the the um, the January proposal. Okay, because I, I noticed it said in the document that there was nine hundred million dollars in revenue for the twenty four twenty five. Yes, but if it didn't take effect till twenty five twenty six, I was wondering how that because would uh, it would uh, be for the twenty five tax year. So half of that year begins in. I got you. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, we talked about state workforce. I just want to be very clear. There are no furloughs. There are no pay cuts. Will state bargaining units still get their con uh, agreed to cost of living adjustments in out years? Yes, the uh, the current bargain agreements will still see their cost of living adjustments uh, and there are no furloughs. Okay, so only impacts to state workforce are the 10,000 position roughly sweep. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Hi. Um, can you talk about, like, the total solutions the governor's proposing? Because in the summary here, it kind of seems to divide them into, like, two different charts. It has the ones from January and then the additions in this revision. But the, I just want the total numbers of all, like, the reductions, revenue, delays, et cetera. And I don't see a chart that has – It's it was confusing because it said in, like, the fact sheet – had one number, then he presented like fifteen billion in his presentation, and I don't, I don't understand where those numbers are coming from. Yeah, so there are um, uh, the, this 
you know, it's not simple to just tie because we're going back to building upon solutions from the governor's budget. Uh, and, uh, and then we also are talking about solutions for the following fiscal year. So it's a little bit easier following fiscal year. Yeah. There's $28.4 billion okay. of solutions for 25, 26. And I think those are broken down in that sheet. I think I see it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then for, but for the, um, the current fiscal year, I think there's, um, there are, there's a breakdown of solutions by cat category of what's left because we have to net out the uh, early action. And I do have those here somewhere. Yeah, I just want to know. I, okay, yeah, looking at this again, this is just for 25, 26. And yeah, honestly, and I can't even think about that. I just want to look at just this fiscal year, like what he wants to do for this fiscal year with the solutions. And I don't see one that totals all of the reductions, et cetera. For this yeah, so, the, so what's left? Um, uh, do you just add those two together, like the chart on page six and the chart on page seven? Well, no, and I think that the, that chart there is trying to just show kind of there's the incremental may revise uh, uh, changes. But what, what is, um, when we look at the bigger picture uh, for the budget window through 24-25, and we take into account what was proposed at January, uh, the um, early action package, and then what's being proposed now, what's left after that. Um, and so, and there are a number of ways to slice this, but if you look at it from that perspective, there are um, uh, 2.5 billion in uh, pauses, delays, about 3.2 billion in fund shifts, 14.7 million in reductions, and then 2.3 million in revenue borrowing. Is that is that anywhere in here? Can I like is there a visual of that somewhere? I, could... It's I don't believe it's in the introduction there, but it's something that we could provide follow up and provide yeah. for you. Okay, um, and then the CDCR reductions around prison. So that that's new, correct? Like because I know the governor has announced plans to close yards, prisons, et cetera. This is a new proposal in terms of like the housing changes. Yes, that's okay. The new proposal at the May revision. Okay, gotcha. Hi, it's still Blake with Politico. Um, yeah, I, w I wondered uh, if there was anything that you all learned from the pandemic about the net operating loss suspension and, um, you know, whether you saw any kind of deterrent to business growth or business retention in the state. I mean, one thing that we heard in terms of feedback and we, we tried to take in, into account here was um, the fact that starting it in the budget year um, means it's impacting taxpayers for the current uh, tax year and decisions had already been made, and so um, we learned a lesson from that, and that's one of the reasons why we um, we decided to um, put it off a year um, based on that feedback. Gotcha, makes sense. All right, that's all. Thanks. Hi, I'm the last question. Um, can you explain what the healthcare workforce reductions are? Does that mean people are going to lose their jobs, or is that like when we talk about those initiatives, is that something else? It should not impact jobs. It is a really um, uh, impacting initiatives from in, uh, the huge investments that were be, have been made in um, workforce in the last uh, last couple of years as we had those surpluses. But I think as the governor alluded to, as we were making those reductions, we also are seeing a huge influx of, uh, of federal funds uh, and other funding sources for for, uh, for workforce needs, uh, and so those reductions should be mitigated somewhat, somewhat by, by other funds. Okay, thanks. 